Blog Talk Radio. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Brain Builders Podcast. I am your host, Dr. John DeWitt, and today we're going to dive further into Dr. Amon's book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life. Today we're talking about handling your new brain and how to deal with denial. So we start out today with a testimonial from Dr. Amon's office. Uh, his name is Ben. Let me give an example of how brain system problems can, can affect the workplace. Ben was on the verge of being fired. He was frequently late to work, disorganized, forgetful, late on deadlines, and off task. His boss let his behavior slide because she felt bad that Ben had a good heart and wanted to do well. His boss's boss, however, wanted Ben fired. He thought Ben was bad for overall discipline and morale. Ben's boss was my patient. I was treating her for ADD. She saw many of her own characteristics in Ben. One day, she asked Ben to come into her office. She told him her own story about her problems in school and with timeliness, organization, distractibility, and procrastination. She told him she had ADD and that her treatment had made a big difference for her. She said that her boss wanted her to fire him, but she had convinced him to give Ben another chance. She, su- she suggested that Ben seek professional help. If he could um, relate to her story, Ben started to cry. His history was a carbon copy of hers. He had done poorly in school and had trouble with concentration, organization, completing assignments, and underachievement. He did not expect his boss to care enough about him to try to help her, try to help him, I should say. Other employers would just fire him, as the boss's boss wanted to. Ben came to see me, Dr. Amon. He had a classic case of ADD with a four circles plan that included medication and ant therapy, which is automatic negative thoughts, by the way, which is a really important thing because you'll notice if you pay attention to that, especially when you wake up in the morning, you start worrying about stuff. You got to stop that. You got to kill ants early. Stop all the automatic negative thoughts that just pop in your head every as soon as you start worrying or waking up to realize that you have to go back to work that day or whatever. His behavior improved dramatically. His boss and those higher up in the company saw a wonderful turnaround in Ben. The company saved money by not having to hire and retrain someone to take Ben's place, and Ben was deeply grateful that he was given another chance along with the information he needed to heal. The odds are that he will always be a loyal employee of this company. Internal life. All of these brain systems can have a significantly negative effect on internal life, self-esteem, emotional health, and physical health. Depression, which is from the limbic system, clouds the sense of accomplishment even with incredible achievement and causes intense sadness and internal pain. Depression is not the absence of feeling, but rather the presence of painful feelings. Depression is one of the most common precursors to drug abuse and suicide. Depression often compromises immune system function, leaving people more prone to illness. The tension and panic associated with anxiety, often a result of basal ganglia problems, can feel like torture. Dr. Amon has known many patients with panic attacks who become suicidal in hope of escaping their fear. Anxiety is often associated with physical tension and an increase in illness. Many anxious people self-medicate by drinking alcohol, taking drugs, overeating, engaging in inappropriate sex, and other potentially addictive behaviors. Overfocus, which is singulate issues, causes repetitive thoughts and worries that are often self-medicated with drugs or alcohol. Internal torture by constant worry is common. When someone says one negative thing, they may hear it in their minds 500 times. They cannot get away from negative thoughts. People with prefrontal cortex issues, such as ADD, often feel a tremendous sense of underachievement, repetitive failure, and lower self-esteem. People with prefrontal cortex issues may use internal problems for self-stimulation and be chronically upset. The stress associated with these problems is often accompanied by increased illness. Temporal lobe problems can wreak internal havoc. The internal violent mood swings and thoughts often torment the soul. Unpredictable behavior, low frustration tolerance, misperceptions, and memory problems are often associated with an internal sense of damage. Anger often alienates others, and loneliness is common. Gaining access to your own good brain. The internal problems associated with these brain system difficulties can ruin lives, relationships, and careers. 
It is essential to seek help when necessary. It is also critical for people not to be too proud to get help. This is especially difficult for people that were like professional athletes and things like that. They're very macho type guys. Pride often devastates relationships, careers, and even life itself. Too many people feel they are somehow less than others if they seek help. Dr. Amon often tells his patients that in his experience, it is the successful people who seek help when they need it. Successful business people hire the best possible outside consultants when they are faced with a problem that they cannot solve or when they need extra help. Unsuccessful people tend to deny they have problems, bury their heads, and blame others for their problems. If your attitude, behavior, thoughts, or feelings sabotage your chances for success in relationships, work, or within yourself, get help. Don't feel ashamed. Feel as though you're being good to yourself. In thinking about getting help, it is important to put these brain system problems in perspective. I just want to be normal. Recently, Sarah came up to Dr. Amon after a lecture and started to cry. When she composed herself, she told him about her son, William, who had bipolar disorder and refused to take his meds because he just wanted to be normal. But as his illness worsened, he had been arrested three times, and she had been sick with worry. Then one day, she watched one of his public, Dr. Amon's public television shows and heard him say, it is normal to have a problem. It is actually more normal to have a problem than not to have a problem. Normal is a myth. She recorded it for her son. When he came to understand he had a brain problem, just like people can have eye problems or heart problems, he took his medicine and began to do so much better. The mother told me that her son often said normal people get help. The smarter they are, the sooner they get it. I tell my patients, Dr. Amon tells his patients, to get rid of the concept of normal versus not normal. Most of us have traits from one or more brain system misfires. Sometimes the problems associated with each section are subclinical. They don't get in your way too much. And sometimes they are severe enough that they significantly interfere with your life. One of the most persuasive arguments Dr. Amon gives potential patients about seeking help is that Dr. Amon is often able to help them have more access to their own good brain. When their own brain does not work efficiently, they can't be efficient. And that's not good. Okay. Um... When their brain works right, they can work right. Dr. Amon will often show, show them a number of brain spec studies to show them the differences between being on and off medication or supplements or from targeted psychotherapy as a way to help them understand the concept. As you can imagine, after looking at the images in this book, well, obviously you can't see them, but they're pretty impactful. When you see an underactive brain versus one that is healthy, you want the one that is healthy put this in a visual for you, you've got the bad brain that looks like Swiss cheese which all, with all kinds of under-functioning, misfunctioning parts of the brain. And then after therapy, you see a nice full brain without any holes in it, basically. Dr. Amon actually spoke in Normal, Illinois at a major university several years ago. He got to meet normal people, shop at the normal grocery store, see the normal police department and fire department. He even met normal women. They were a very nice group, but really not much different from folks in California. The normal people seem to have all the same problems mentioned in the book. So what to do when a loved one is in denial about needing help? And personally, I am dealing with this with my parents. Unfortunately, the stigma associated with psychiatric illness prevents many people from getting help. People do not want to be seen as crazy, stupid, or defective, and they often don't seek help until they or their loved one can no longer tolerate the pain at work in their relationship or within themselves. Here's the story of Jerry and Jenny. When Jerry and Jenny started to have marital problems early in their marriage, Jenny wanted to get help. Jerry refused. He said that he didn't want to air his problems in front of a stranger. It wasn't until Jenny threatened to leave him that he finally agreed to go for counseling. Initially, Jerry listed many reasons why he wouldn't go for help. He didn't see that the problems were that bad. It was too much money. He thought all counselors were messed up. And he didn't want to be perceived as crazy by anyone who might find out about the counseling. Unfortunately, Jerry's attitude is common among men. Many men who face when faced with obvious problems in their marriages, their children, or even themselves, refuse to see the issue. Their lack of awareness and strong tendency toward denial prevent them from seeking help until more damage than necessary has been done. In Jerry's case, he had to be threatened with divorce before he would go. Another factor in Jerry's case was that he had ADD. As a child, he had been forced to see a counselor for behavioral problems at school. He hated feeling different from the other kids and resented his mom for making him talk to the doctor. 
Some people may say it is unfair for me to pick on men. And indeed, some men see problems long before some women do. Overall, however, in my experience, mothers see problems in children before fathers do and are more willing to seek help, and many more wives call for marital counseling than husbands. What is it in our society that causes men to overlook obvious problems, to deny problems until it is too late to deal with them effectively, or until unnecessary damage is done? Some of the answers may be found in how boys are raised, the societal expectations we place on men, and the overwhelming pace of men's, many men's daily lives. Boys most often engage in active play, such as sports, war games, video games, etc., that involves little dialogue or communication. The games often involve dominance and submission, winning and losing, and little inter- interpersonal communication. Force, strength, or skill is used to handle problems. Girls, on the other hand, often engage in more interpersonal or communicative types of play, such as with dolls and storytelling. Fathers often take their sons out to throw the ball around or shoot hoops rather than to go for a walk and talk. That's definitely for sure in the South. Uh, Many men retain the childhood notions of competition and that one must be better than others to be any good at all. To admit to a problem is to be less than other men. As a result, many men wait to seek help until their problem is obvious to the whole world. Other men feel totally responsible for all that happens in their families. To admit a, to, to a problem is to admit that they have in some way failed. Clearly, the pace of life prevents some men from being able to take the time to look clearly at the important people in their lives and their relationships with them. When Dr. Amon spends time with fathers and husbands, he helps them slow down enough to see what is really important to them. More often than not, they begin to see the problems and work toward more helpful solutions. The issue is not one of being uncaring or uninterested. It is not seeing what is there. Many teenagers also resist getting help, even when faced with obvious problems. They worry about labels and don't want yet another adult judging their behavior. Here are several suggestions to help people who are unaware of the problem or unwilling to get the help they need. And those are things that we will discuss in the next episode of the Brain Builders podcast. Very exciting. So the different suggestions to help people that are unaware of the problem or unwilling to get the help they need. Wow. It is, that is something that is especially true in the cognitive health uh, arena. People, I mean, personally, nobody wants to feel like they're losing their grip on reality and they definitely don't want their friends or their community to be aware of it because they think that people are going to start talking about them. This is especially true in small towns. I'm from a, a, the second largest city in the state in Arkansas, but it's only got 85,000 people. And social hierarchy is predominant there. They Everybody wants to feel like they're at the top of the ladder. And you're not, you don't want to admit that there's something wrong. And it's just really hard to get past that and not just going out and shooting hoops or, you know, playing football or whatever, but there you go out and you're killing animals, going hunting, you're going uh, fishing and things like that. Very, very non-communicative, communicative activities if you're a guy. And it's just, uh, it's really unfortunate because if guys open up and really get serious about what's going on, then they can get their help that they need and then maybe they won't go as far downhill as they will if they just ignore it and try to act like everything's fine. So um, if you would like to partake in my next Brain Builders Masterclass online, you can go to bit.ly slash waitlist BB. We have a lot of great people in there. We're having a great time, a lot of really great um, educational information. I'm posting a lot of different files in in the private Facebook group videos, um, hour-long coaching sessions every Friday. And it's really been a lot, a lot of help and a lot of fun. We've had the uh, former sports psychologist for the LA Lakers in there trying to address some of the behavioral issues. Uh, we have a keto coach front that works with uh, Dr. Berg, Dr. Eric Berg. He's phenomenal, and she's helping us with nutritional aspects. Uh, there's also a link in the podcast in the description if you'd like to join the wait list there. So thankful that you've listened, and I hope you share this information and this podcast with your friends and people can use it. I'm your host, Dr. John DeWitt, and this has been the Brain Builders Podcast. We'll see you next time.